Hi everyone, this is Shona coming to you this week with your tutor check-in for geometry. You're going to be working on three sections this week for four, five, one, and five, two. So let's take a look at some of the material that you'll be working with. I'm going to bring up the material on my file menu and then share it on the screen. The first um, section deals with a form that might be unfamiliar to you called the trapezoid. And trapezoids, like other quadrilaterals, um, have specific properties. I'm going to let this come up and I will share my screen once it does. Here we go. So now, let's take a look. This is the trapezoid. And a trapezoid, as I mentioned, is a quadrilateral. Here's an example of what one looks like. It has exactly one pair of parallel sides. So it doesn't have to be the top and the bottom. It could be the left and the right. But the sides that are parallel to each other, the sides that are always going in the same direction, are called the bases. And the other two sides are called the legs. And the base angles are the angles that are um, adjacent to the bases, as you might expect. And we have some formulas that we're going to be going over. But before we get to that, every trapezoid contains two pairs of consecutive interior angles that are supplementary. So once again, consecutive angles um, come on consecutive vertices of the trapezoid and they're on the same side of the two bases. Those are supplementary. Two pairs of consecutive interior angles that are supplementary. And we have some other properties. Um, we can have something that we call a right trapezoid, where we have a right angle in um, one of the angles, actually it would have to be two of them. Um, and then because they add up to 180 on the same side, you have to have two of them. Now we have a couple of examples for you on the coming slides before we get to the next definition, which is the altitude of a trapezoid. Now this can get a little bit confusing. It's not meant to be, but it can be. The altitude of a trapezoid is a line segment from one base of the trapezoid perpendicular to the opposite base. So altitudes are always perpendicular from the base. So you start at a base and you drop a straight line perpendicular to the other base. If you don't have room, you can go ahead and extend the side and create a perpendicular, but it's always perpendicular and that's also called the height. Now we have isosceles trapezoid and just like isosceles triangles, isosceles trapezoids have two sides that are congruent. Notice not parallel. Um, two legs are congruent. Then we call it an isosceles trapezoid. So these are not the parallel sides of the trapezoid. These are the other two sides, okay? And the other two sides, if they're congruent, we call it an isosceles trapezoid. 
we have some theorems for you about isosceles trapezoids that relate to the diagonals. And we also have a theorem about the medians of a trapezoid, okay? So be sure you study these theorems. Be sure that you're looking at the PowerPoint. So she put the theorems for you on a single slide and there are examples. And we have a concept summary of all of the different types of quadrilaterals that you've studied in the chapters. So we have parallelograms in that group, rectangles, rhombuses, squares. We have other pairs of, I'm sorry, other types of quadrilaterals with only one pair of parallel sides, which are the trapezoid and the isosceles trapezoid. And then you have the kite. So that's a little overview of section 4.4, the trapezoid. Let's move on now to chapter five. And in chapter five, you're going to be starting to study something called similar figures. And similar figures doesn't just mean that they are related to each other. Similar figures means that the figures are uh, the corresponding sides are proportional to each other. So before we get into a whole set of similar triangles and similar figures, we're going to talk a little bit about a review of some of your algebra and pre-algebra topics, ratios, rates, and proportions, and the difference between a rate and a ratio. So a ratio compares two numbers by division, and she gives you examples here. So basically a ratio is a fraction. Um, it's not the only way we can write a ratio, but it is the most common. Um, and as I said, she gives you some examples of ratios and rates in here. Now, a rate is a specific kind of ratio. So a rate is a specific kind of ratio that contains different units of measure in the numerator and denominator. So you might be able to reduce the numbers, but you can't cancel the unit. If I tell you seven days to one week, that technically is a rate, not a ratio, because the units are different. If I change the week to seven days and write seven days over seven days, then I have a one-to-one -one ratio. That's the difference. So the key difference between a ratio and a rate is whether the units in the numerator and denominator are the same. So that's how that works. And we have some other definitions there. For you, we have one other definition in this section, and that is proportion. So we have a proportion is an equation stating that two ratios are equal. And one of the ways that we solve this is with cross multiplication. So we multiply across the equal sign. This is not cross canceling because we're not multiplying the fractions. We're multiplying the numbers across the equal sign with each other. You accomplish the same end result if you multiply by the common denominator of the entire equation, which would be VD. You, you accomplish the same result. So there's some examples for you to practice on. At the bottom of this, she gives you some 
solutions. We talk about whether um, pr uh, proportions are true proportions or not. And then we have something called the geometric mean. Um, and the geometric mean has some interesting applications for some of the problems that you're going to be doing later in the section, but it relates to proportions. So be sure that you study that. There are examples of that on the slides. Please make sure that you're looking at the slides. There are several examples here for you. Um, and then we have something called extended ratios, where sometimes we have two or three ratios on top of each other. So that's 5.1. Now, it's all fine and good. I have all these techniques, but it's also good to be able to apply them. And that's more of what starts to happen in section 5.2. So let me bring up 5.2, where we actually start talking about similar figures and start doing some of the uh, proportions and the ratios that, that we have in, uh, in some other sections. So let me let me do this and see if 5.2 will open. Okay, there we go. Let me now share my screen and show you just a little bit about what's in the setting. So, Point, you can all read it. It says similar polygons. And we call two figures that are similar if they have the same shape, but not necessarily the same size. Okay. Now, notice here that the first figures, the two in red, those are similar. Those are basically scaled up versions of each other. But the second group, the blue figure is not similar to the red figure because the shape is different. Number one looks like it could be an isosceles triangle and number three looks like it could be a right triangle. But the we call them the corresponding angles, the angles that are in the same relative position to each other are not the same. And you're going to learn about this in more detail in this section. So we have some of the symbols here for you, corresponds, corresponding. So in similar figures, corresponding sides, corresponding angles are a big deal. And so we talk about similar quadrilateral. Remember here, don't get confused, OK? Um, the arc markings tell you congruent, but follow the markings. So angle A has one arc, follow it to H, which has one arc. That means A is congruent to H. B has two congruent marks, follow it to J, which has two congruent marks, and match them up. These figures are similar because their corresponding angles are congruent. Okay, so this now, once you establish that figures are similar, then we have some very powerful things that we can do with similar figures because it turns out that corresponding sides of similar figures are proportional in length. And that's where the proportions come in. And that's what some of these examples talk to you about, okay? I just wanna draw your attention briefly 
to some of the figures in this um, this exercise. These are three dimensional figures. You have a rectangular solid, two of them. Um, and you're testing here the corresponding ratios, okay? We're not doing a whole lot of heavy lifting with finding a lot of similar dimensions, although we could. We're just trying to show right now that the figures are similar. And we have some exercises in here that help you do that. We have some similar ratios, some, some examples of that. So that's honestly pretty much it for this week and these three sections that you're going through. I hope that this little brief overview has helped you. If you have any questions during the week, please um, reach out to us. One thing to note is that when you're asking questions, it's fine to say, I'm stuck on number 40, 42, say, on page, I don't know, 185. It's fine to say that. But if you can send us your work or something that gives us insight into your thought processes, that's much better for us and for you. And it helps us tailor a response that's more in keeping with the question you're trying to ask. I know that sometimes it's hard to know what question to ask, but try to ask a question based on your work. I got this far, I don't know what to do after this step, or I'm not sure if I should do this or that. Some kind of indication of where your thought process has been so we can help you. In any case, I hope that you found this small video helpful, this check-in, and I look forward to seeing you very soon. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Be healthy. Bye for now.